Way back in the 1980s, badge was everything. Brand was key. Yuppies were literally throwing themselves out of windows to be wearing the latest from Armani, Gucci and Versace. And of course, Tarquin. Well, he really wanted to drive a BMW, Mercedes-Benz or a Jaguar. But even that badge within a badge was important because whilst you had worked really, really hard to get your 318i, Tarquin on the 22nd floor, he drove a 325i because he was better than you. But then in 1989, something really, really odd happened. You see, 1989 was the year of Lexus. The Japanese brand, whose parent company, Toyota, decided to take on the world's luxury car makers and show that they could do it just as well, if not better, than everyone else. And their first car, the LS400, was measurably better than the Mercedes-Benz S-Class, the Jaguar XJ and BMW 7 Series of the time. But of course, we've moved on since then. 34 years later, and whilst those yuppies are maybe a little bit older, they're certainly a little bit more socially responsible. And they no longer want to be driving around in their big V12 Uber saloons. What they really want is an all-electric, premium-badged SUV. Which is why, although they're late to the party, Lexus are hoping that history will repeat itself, as they are now offering one in their range with this car. Welcome to Scotland, welcome to this week's road test review of the new Lexus RZ450e and as always, welcome to Auto EV. <laughs> Now, before we go on to this week's road test review of the new Lexus RZ450e, please remember to make sure that you are subscribed to the Auto EV channel. Now, once you've done that, press the bell button that's down below because then that way you'll be notified when our next video gets uploaded and goes live. Once you've watched the video, if you do enjoy it, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And of course, don't forget to leave us your comments down below. Let us know your thoughts on the cars that we view, such as the Lexus RZ450e, and of course, on the Auto EV channel as a whole. So, Lexus. Well, 34 years they've been with us now, and they've established themselves well, um, especially against those premium brands that I mentioned right at the start, you know, the BMW, the Mercedes-Benz, Jaguar, even the Audis of the world. And they kind of made their mark over the decades by sort of giving us hybrids. Um, and it's odd that the fact that it's taken them so long and they're so far behind the competition at getting a full bespoke EV onto the marketplace because this is the first. Now, despite you're gonna sit there and go, well, hang on a minute, Brian, what about the UX300e? Yes, that's their first electric car, but it's not a bespoke electric car because obviously it's spun from the UX250h hybrid, which has a piston engine car. So it's not a ground up EV, whereas the RZ450e. Now it borrows the platform from parent company Toyota with its ETNGA platform, which obviously underpins the Toyota BZ4X and the Subaru Solterra. Two cars we've tested, and to be fair, two cars that do have their flaws. However, as we will see, Lexus have gone to great lengths to differentiate the RZ450e from those other two and make it their own. But is it enough? Have they done enough to stand comparison with all those other premium luxury SUVs that are out there. But before we get started, again, let's take a quick snapshot at what the Lexus RZ450e is actually all about. So it's based on Toyota's ETNGA platform that also underpins the company's BZ4X and of course, its technical part of Subaru's Solterra. It also uses the same 71.4 kilowatt hour battery of the Toyota, but it delivers drive solely through all four wheels with no single motor drivetrain offered as yet. It is priced between £64,500 and all the way up to £71,500, depending on specification. And it has a range of between 252 and 272 miles, depending on that specification and wheel size. So the question is, does that make the Lexus RZ450e just a very expensive badge engineering project? So in other words, it's a reskinned Toyota BZ4X, or does the Lexus have its own qualities that's going to make it stand toe to toe with those other premium rivals from BMW, Mercedes, Audi and Jaguar. Well, of course, the only way they're going to answer that question is by putting it through the road test that actual car buyers trust when it comes to choosing their next electric vehicle. And that 
is the Auto EV one. All right, let's kick off with styling. And successful, I think, is the, the one word I'm gonna use for this. It has really differentiated itself from the quite kind of oddly kind of styled and oddly angled Toyota and Subaru. Whilst I do like those cars, I think the Lexus really, really has knocked out the park with the styling of this. I've always said Lexus has been a bit, well, they've been a bit hit or miss when it comes to some of their styling. Some of the cars are quite forgettable, but there are others that are really, really stand out you know, sort of like almost bite the back of your hand gorgeous, like their LS, uh, sorry, their LC500 sports car and their RC Coupe. I think those are two outstanding looking cars. Their SUVs have been, again, hit or miss. This for me is a hit. I really like the look of this car. And as I say, it's different enough. Now, of course, Lexus's big kind of styling signature, much like BMW have this, sort of like the double kidney grille, has always been that sort of new kind of spindle grill, but of course you don't need it on an electric car, but they've retained the shape of it. You see, you've got that kind of spindle grill there, and of course you've got the little kind of hatches that come in here as if to give the impression of it starting. But then there's this just against the kind of front bit. It's got this little kind of pointed kind of nose here, which I really do like, and of course the big prominent Lexus badge there. Cooling's provided down at the bottom here. But it's really, really sharply styled, I think, this car. Look at these new LED um, headlamps with a kind of signature kind of tech DRLs running through them. Really like that. Now, this particular car's got the optional bi-tone paint finish. And whilst I don't mind the kind of black roof and mirrors, I'm not so keen on the black bonnet, but it is an option, so you don't have to have that. But I have to say, you know, this particular blue is quite nice. Anyway, uh, back to the styling. Yeah, I really like some of the sharp lines that they've got going on here. Almost that kind of Japanese origami kind of look. Really, really sharp creases on it. And as I say, they've done enough to differentiate it and move it away from the Toyota and the Subaru. The Subaru version of the Toyota BZ4X really does look like the same car. There's just the odd little cue around it. Whereas this car, I think, really stands on its own and it's, it's got its own signature design and it's a proper, proper Lexus. And I think it's a real cracker. Now, as we move around the side, narrowly avoiding all the sheep things that are left on a Scottish hillside, um, you can really see, as I say, those sharp creases again that I was talking about. This one here, I absolutely love. Look at this wheel arch kind of just sweeps around and then just spears up across that door. And then you get that extra one that goes up to that rear, that rear window there, that one there. Really like those two lines there. It gives the eye, this one here, I think, gives the idea of motion. It sort of makes the car look very kind of sleek and just gives the idea of the car moving forward and I really like that. The car is bigger than the Toyota, so it's 4,805 millimetres long, so 4.8 metres in length. So it is longer than the Toyota and it's slightly wider, although it sits a bit lower, so it's got more of a kind of sleek kind of stance about it, a more sporting stance rather than utilitarian. Of course, you still get the, the sort of like the sort of like the, the gloss black kind of wheel arch extensions um, that you get, but they're not squared off like they are in the Toyota and the Subaru. They're a bit more kind of rounded. Now, wheel sizes start at 18 inch, so you've got 18 inch on the base cars. These are the 20s, which come on the top spec Takumi, and they're an option on the mid spec car as well. Um, this is a Takumi pack car. I see you can see that kind of gloss black roof and mirrors contrasting against the, the door body colour here. And of course, that lower sill section, again, which has that nice kind of little rise in it, just to kind of pinch the bodywork in. As I say, just the, the, the sharpness of this design is just really outstanding. I really like it. Um, door handles, well, they are, but you don't sort of like pull them out. They've just got little touch pads behind them, which you just touch and they just open. That's really, really nice. And it's a nice little touch, and there's lots of those little kind of tactile qualities that Lexus have spent a lot of time, little details that you, you'll see when we certainly when we look at the interior that just make the car just feel a bit more special, as I say, than some of the other cars in the class. As we go towards the rear of the car, you've got these kind of nice differentiated sort of like rear lights and then you've got the twin little roof spoils which you'll see when we're around the back. But yeah, good looking car I think this. Yeah, so around the back as I say, look, you get these little kind of protruding kind of, I don't know what you'd really call them actually, they're just little tiny little twin kind of speak, peak spoilers, it does not, doesn't go across the full width of the car, but they're nice, they're distinctive. Now it doesn't have a rear wiper, in fairness, it does not, and regular readers know that would be a real bugbear for me. However, it's probably the one car that I've tested, where I have to say that I know if it did have one stuck on there, it really would look quite incongruous, because there's no spot, you can't tuck it underneath a spoiler there or anything like that. So, and there is quite a rake to this screen, in fairness. So, as I say, the airflow is designed to sort of take it off from there. So, I might, in a world first, 
kind of forgive it for that, if I'm honest with you. Hmm. Make a note of the time and date I said that. Right, what else is different? Well, the rear is different to the other cars as well. You don't have the big kind of wrap round tail lights that you get on the Toyota and Subaru. Instead, you get the Lexus kind of light bar, which goes across. And it's lovely Lexus script across the back there, which I really do like. Um, high level brake lights mounted in this kind of integrated kind of spoiler, just at the top of the bullet here. Lots of cameras around the car. Really, really interesting kind of parking camera system on it, which I'll show you what inside it. But there is loads of cameras and sensors around it, and it, it does some really trick stuff, which I'm really impressed with. Um, you get these fake vents at the side here, which uh, I'm not so keen on, but I don't know what you'd put. You know, I see other manufacturers, let's see, with little Vauxhall, you could have put those reflectors in there, and nobody would have really said any different. And of course, you get parking sensors along the bottom here, pa uh, reversing camera there. Um, you get the boot release which is tucked underneath there but you've also got the ability to kind of swipe your foot underneath as well so to open the boot as well so once you do that when the car's open it'll open the boot as well and um, other than that you've just got your your rz 450 badge there and that's really about it now as i say it's a completely different style to the toyota and the subaru whereas if you looked at the subaru quickly you'd maybe be for forgiven for thinking you were looking at the bz4x I don't think that's the case with the RZ. I think, as I say, this is one of Lexus's best designs. And if, gun to my head, I think other than the likes of the Jaguar I-Pace, I think this could be the best looking car in its class. But what do you think? As always, please let us know in the comments down below. Now, that's 522 litres which is good for class. It's much bigger than the Subaru and the Toyota, obviously because the car is a longer car, as I say. And it's bigger than the much larger BMW iX, which is only 500 litres, although it does trail uh, the Jaguar I-Pace and the Audi Q8 e-tron. Um, although it doesn't really look at it. I think this is quite a good size of boot. Now, I don't have my suitcases with me because I'm up visiting my mother, and if I turned up with four suitcases, she'd probably think the worst, so I didn't bring them. But anyway, they would certainly fit in there so, you know, no problem at all with ample room to spare, um, you know, for extra bags like camera bags or hold alls or rucksacks and stuff. Um, you've got a 60 40 split rear seat as well, so that folds down. Although not entirely flat, you do obviously, most of the EVs it's the same, you've got that slight kind of ramp up, but at least you do have the split. Where it doesn't bode quite so well is you don't have a, a through load facility, so you can't have, you know, you, if you had a longer load, just like a few planks of wood or whatever, you can't just stick them through there, you've got to knock one of the sides of the seats down, so that's a little bit of a, a downside with that. Uh, what else have we got? Okay, well we've got, um, you've got little hooks up in the side there, where you can sort of like hand bags from, and you've got some nice chromed tie down lashings on the side there's four of them so you can use your bungee cords to, to lash luggage down you've got good underfloor storage as well so all your cables uh, fit in here no problem at all the other nice thing about um, the boot of this is it's got one of these parcel shelves now while i'm not a big lover of these kind of flimsier style parcel shelves this one is pretty good because what you do is when you do take it out it folds in half and it'll just store underneath there, which I think is great because I always, you know, whenever I do a tip run, I'm always trying to find where to put the parcel shelf uh, in my car. So I think that's a really neat, neat, neat solution. It's quite a steeply raked back. So in terms of stacking really big um, boxes or luggage, you might be a bit limited, but on the whole, that's a fairly decent size of boot, I'd suggest. However, despite the bespoke EV architecture, as you find with a lot of cars, even in this class, because of the all-wheel drive systems, because of, sort of like the heating and ventilation controls and such like, um, you don't have, he says, if you can find the bonnet latch. Well, that's embarrassing, isn't it? There we go. You don't have any under bonnet storage. And also, no gas struts. You've got to use a bonnet stay. That's a bit disappointing, Lexus. But yeah, nothing up there. Sorry. However, when it comes to rear seat space, all is forgiven because bespoke EV platform means bags of room back here. So the seat is obviously set up for myself at five foot seven. Um, and I've got absolutely just acres of leg space here. Um, the foot room's okay. As I say, if you're a regular viewer, you'll know I like my seat quite low down. So I can get my feet underneath it, um, which is fine. But other people might raise the seat up a little bit more, so it give you a bit more foot room. Um, you don't feel the floor being pushed up too bad unless you sit like this, 
like you're sitting in church. If your kind of lounge is normal, it's fine. Um, you will get three across because there is a completely flat floor across here, um, which again, another um, benefit of being on a bespoke EV platform. Um, you've got your flip down armrest here with cup holders, but as I say, remember, no load through facility. Now this car, as I say, is the Takumi, which is the range topping car. And it gets this lovely material called um, Ultra Suede. I'll talk to you a bit more about that when I sit in the front and we're talking about materials and stuff, but it feels really, really nice back here. Um, you've got um, Isofix points, which are nice and easy to get. So the Isofix points are, are dead simple to get to. I see there's two cup holders in that armrest. There's, there's bottle holders on the door, which should be enough for a water bottle. Let me just try with my bottle. Plenty of room there, absolutely bags of room for a water bottle down in there, so that's good. Uh, one downside is no rear climate controls. There's heated rear seats in this particular car, but it's not a four zone climate control, which is a bit odd at this sort of like level um, of car. You do get two USB-C ports, however, and a three pin socket as well. So you do have that. So if somebody in the back is needing to charge the laptop, you do have the ability for that. Um, the other thing you've got is this wonderfully uh, this wonderful panoramic sunroof which is dimmable so it'll go at the touch of a button it's very clever it goes from opaque to clear um, and I love it I think it's fantastic so although you've got the kind of central spine of it it doesn't make any odds and you've got this really light headlining so you get the feeling of a lot of space back here talking of space headroom wise well yeah absolutely plenty again maybe it's because the, the, the car's longer it's like it's like different styling Nobody's really going to have an issue in terms of headroom or even any space back here. It's going to be absolutely fine for most people's needs. So yeah, other than the lack of rear climate control and the load through facility, it's good for rear accommodation, definitely. Now, like I was saying about the exterior, um, Lexus have really upped the game. This is one of the most successful interiors, I think, that they've done. They've had a little bit of a kind of... I don't know, they've not really been up there with some of their interiors um, as against some of their rivals. And if you've watched a UX300E um, video, you'll know that there was elements of that interior, whilst all right, some of the materials were lovely, the rest of it was a bit, well, we didn't really get on so well with it. Now, it's getting a big refresh this year, the UX300E, which hopefully we'll get, to, um, we'll get to test soon and bring that review to you again. And I know things have changed for it in the interior. But moving on to the RZ450E, this is, I think, as I say, one of Lex's best efforts. But it's not perfect, as we will now see. So let's start with the main event, which is this 14-inch screen. Graphics are very, very good. The instrumentation panel and all the fonts they use, they don't seem that kind of slightly blurry, um, which may always mean we think my glasses needed a clean kind of font and legibility. It's really clear, it's really crisp. However, once we start the car, we get this every single time so every time you start the car you've got to click on the terms of use and privacy notice and you hear the noise it makes it makes that noise all the time too so that's not just once so when you stop at the shop nip out get your paper come back in you got to do it again every time i don't know why once you've done it surely that should be it the other thing as i said to you this car beeps and bongs so much if i go into reverse why is it doing that? I know it's in reverse. I've put it in reverse. You don't need to keep telling me. It was my choice. I made that conscious decision. I really don't like that at all. And even things like the parking support brake off. So again, every time I start the car up, you've got to take that notice off. There's a huge amount of this that goes on through um, the RZ. Not just those little bits there. You know, um, the other thing that really, really bugs me as well is the, the driver, I'm sorry, I'm wavering a little bit here, but while I've got it in my mind, the driver assistance package. So if you go into here and you go into drive assist, because of the way that um, European law is, um, where all these safety systems default on all the time. So you've got to turn them off. So the road sign assist is the most annoying for me because when you're on a road, if you're on a road like here, which is 60 miles an hour, if you do 61 miles an hour, it starts making that binging noise at you, unless you turn this off. And you've got to turn it off every time. So when you switch the car off, go back in, happens again, you've got to go back in and turn it all off. It's a real faff. I like things to remain off when I've turned them off. When I turn my TV off at night and go to bed, I don't come downstairs the next morning and find it's back on again because it thinks you'll probably want to watch TV. I don't. If I do, I'll switch it on. Anyway, that's 
that's my beef with that. The screen itself is good. Um, you get wireless CarPlay, Apple CarPlay, but wired Android Auto. Now, this is something I get asked about a lot, and I must admit, I don't know why uh, Android Auto sometimes is wired. I think something to do with the processing power, something to do with the, I don't know. Maybe you can let us know, but I, we do get asked that a lot. So if you know the answer, let me know. But as you see, you do get wireless Apple CarPlay in it. Um, the navigation the, that you get with Lexus is good. So the screen is very, very good. And I like it. And it's nice and it's clear. And as I say, it's up in your line of sight. It's really nice. And obviously you can alter its scale, touch a button, da, 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 da. But you hear it makes that really irritating beep all the time. And then all your little kind of icons down the side there. Um, to go into so um, you know for your audio system a uh, DAB uh, FM Bluetooth or obviously um, mirror cast or your, your your car play or whatever so you can do that uh, and then go back home telephone car settings um, there's quite a bit here uh, which I won't go through absolutely everything but you've got drive modes which we'll talk about when we're driving it so normal sport eco range and custom which is quite nice the driver assist package is on there and again, it's a huge amount of safety systems on the car as well. Pre-collision, lane change assist, proactive driving assist, front cross traffic alert, lane departure, road sign assist, blind spot monitoring, rear cross traffic alert. There's another screen. Safe exit assist, that's a good one, I like that. So if you, especially if you're in London or, or one of the big cities where you do get a lot of cyclists that kind of weave in and out traffic, if you've parked up at the side of the road and you're about to get out, if there's a cyclist coming past you, the car will pick up and it won't let you open the door and it'll warn you. Really clever, that's a good one, I like that. <coughs> Excuse me. Parking assist sensor and rear camera detection. So there you go, so that's all that bit there. You've got a web browser there, and then obviously you can go into actual settings itself. Um, so your Bluetooth and devices, your display, your sound and media navigation. So that's all there. So there's plenty to be getting on with. But the screen itself, as I say, is really good. I really like it. It's nice, it's crisp, it's clear. Moving further down, um, a little bit of a mixed bag now because you've got climate control systems which are embedded into the screen, but some are always on as well. So what I do like is these temperature controls here. So a bit like the Mustang Mach-E that has that volume control embedded in the screen. The Lexus has it again for temperature. It's a really nice little kind of glow you get from it so you can alter your temperature on either side. If you want a more detailed climate menu, you press climate there and it comes up. Now, I've got a bit of an issue with the Lexus and it's the same as the Toyota um, and the Subaru as well. If you use the climate control in the car, the amount of range it knocks off is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Now, I will talk about this in the usability section, but I found it really irritating. Now, I've driven from my house in Surrey to my mum's house up in Lockerbie. It's 350 miles. I charged four times yesterday. I don't normally charge. The most I've charged in any other car has been three times. But there was no way I was driving up with the outside temperature hitting nearly 30 degrees with the aircon not on. The other thing that you do get is ventilated seats in the front in this Takumi car, which I love ventilated seats, but even on its maximum, and I thought, well, that'll be fine because I'll just put that on and flick the aircon off. It's like a mouse blowing on your back. I had a 2005 Saab 958 that had ventilated seats. You had to turn them off after a while, otherwise you get frostbite and pneumonia. These are rubbish. They're, and that's them in their maximum setting. And that bloody noise, really irritating. So yeah, so it's not ideal. You, you know, you've got to click the climate control off if you want to save yourself some range. Uh, heated steering wheel. You can sync it up, obviously, on either side there. Um, you can shortcut buttons on, which is your next menu. So maximum heat, maximum cool, silent everything, which would be lovely. And then your drive modes, if they're the ones you use frequently. So you can set them up so the ones that you use frequently, it's all in there. Um, which you can go into, which is good. That's nice. Um, fan speed below is the touch screen. Um, and again, it's okay because it's always on. The only downside is when you're driving, you, you, you're sometimes doing that. You can't, you've can't. you got to really kind of take your eye off the road a little bit to hit the button right. And whilst you don't, it's not a capacitive screen, so you don't get the feedback, you just get that really annoying beep. So at least you've got something, but it's not ideal. There's a physical volume control for your media there. And there is some physical buttons as well for the front defrost, heated rear screen, obviously your heated mirrors. Uh, down here, you've got 
USB connectivity. Um, obviously, if you're using your Android Auto, it's USB-C ports in there. This camera system, I've got to talk to you about this. I love this. This is really good. So if you pick view, look at this. That's underneath the car. That's showing you what's actually underneath the car. So if you're parking up against the curb, look at that. That's great. And you can change it. You can change the view it gives you. That's witchcraft to me. That's really clever. If you're parking up next to a high curb with your 20-inch alloy wheels, it'll show you where the curb is. You've also got a parking assist thing here, so the car will park itself. You know, you press that, the car will find a parking space to park for you. That I really like. I think that's brilliant. That's one of the best things I've used. Uh, what else have we got down here? Right, wireless charging pads in there. This is your gear shift. That's the only thing, um, in some respects, that it kind of shares with the interior of the BZ4X is this rotary um, gear selector. So twist for drive, um, push down for neutral, twist, push and twist for reverse, as we know, and then the button for park. Hold assist, electronic park brake, and your DSC button to switch off. Uh, storage. Two cup holders, they will take big coffee flask and water bottle, we like that. Storage, yes, it's got it underneath here, and it will open either way. Very good. No glove box though, there's no glove box. Now there's a reason for that, and again, it's relating to the climate control system. The Lexus has a thing called radiant heaters, which is effectively radiators. There's a little mesh panel underneath the steering column and underneath the, where a glove box would be, which effectively emits infrared heat when it's needed. So I, I don't know how it does it, whether it detects it from the outside that it might need it. And Lexus say, and I quote, it's the equivalent of driving with a warm blanket over your knees. My grandmother, who's been dead for nearly 20 odd years, running Lexus these days, that's the kind of thing that she would have said. But that's what it is. That's why you don't have glove box. You've got these radiant heaters. Obviously, at the moment, it's, as I say, the middle of summer in Scotland. So maybe I should use them. I don't know. Um, so I don't need to use them. So, But seemingly, that's what they do, and they're very, very good. So there we go. That's why you don't have a glove box in this car. Um, door bins, they're all right. They'll take my glasses. You've also got sunglasses holder up there as well. Um, you've got the touch button up here for the uh, opaque opaque roof. So you just press that and it goes clear or opaque, which is good. That's that. Right, seats. I wanted to talk to you about the materials on the seats. This is this ultra suede. So I keep bleating on about manufacturers using different materials. And this one I really, really do like. Um, it is a mixture of biodegradable and recyclable materials. And to all intents and purposes, it feels like suede and it's lovely. It's one of the nicest materials that I've seen on a seat. It's a bit like BMW when they do the cashmere on the iX and the i7. It's like that. I really like the fact Lexus have done something different. Um, and as I say, the fact that it's sustainable makes it even better. It holds you, it grips you. Um, you don't tend to slide around in the seat at all. It really holds you well. Now, talking of the seats, they're really good. They've got just enough lateral support. They don't have an extendable squab, um, but I don't think they need it. Certainly not for me. I've got more than enough length in the squab. Obviously, there's electric adjustment, and you can tilt it, which I like. The memory control is a bit odd. It's up in the dashboard here, but again, at least it's nice and easy to see and easy to use, so that's quite good. The steering column is electrically adjustable. So you just move that in and out. It's quite an interesting wheel as well. So again, the same material, or sorry, the same as the material on the seats. This is a man-made synthetic, and Lexus call it Tahara. Um, it's a bit like what you get on the Tesla steering wheels. It feels like you're stroking a baby dolphin. Not that I've ever stroked a baby dolphin, but I imagine that's what it feels like. It's a bit odd. I can't decide whether I like it or not. It feels grippy enough, so you never tend to lose your grip on the wheel. Um, but it's not leather and it has a really kind of strange texture to it. I, I'm jury's out on that for me. Um, you've got this here, which is another irritating thing, this driver monitor um, camera. So if you do this, it starts beeping at you to tell you you're not concentrating on the road. But then why make you go across here to do things with our fingers and you have to take your eyes off the road? 
give us physical buttons if you don't want us to take our eyes off the road. That's what I would say. And it's also as well, if you've got your hand like that, if you're driving like that, which I know some people do, it doesn't see your face. So again, it'll come up and tell you you're not paying attention. Put your hands on the wheel. Irritating. The instrument cluster. Take that message off. Um, it's not got a lot there. Well, it's, it doesn't look like a lot, but it has a lot of information. Your speed readout is a digital readout there. And then obviously you've got your miles per kilowatt, clock, temperature on that side, uh, range over there, total mileage, and then all your banks of warning lights either side. Um, it's okay. Actually, I've found it to be really quite decent. The only thing is you can't configure it. That's it. It might have been nice if you'd be able to have, you know, um, a different uh, layout, you know. Like, for instance, I've got a Jeep Grand Cherokee, and you can choose between a, a numerical speedo or an actual speedo. Um, you can't do that here. You've, you've got to have that, which is okay. And as I say, I found it all right in this drive. The head-up display, which I can't show you, but for obvious reasons, the camera won't pick it up, is phenomenal. It's one of the best head-up displays I've seen. You can, you can have a, a very minimal one. You can configure that. You can have a very minimal one, or you can have a lot of information on it. And what it also does is really clever. Um, where, so as you're driving along, if you touch one of the steering wheel buttons, it brings up a picture of the... the it brings up an image of, of the button pack, and it highlights the one you're pressing. So it knows which one... You know, you, you, you just lay your finger on it and knows what you want, so you can see without taking your eyes off the road what you're doing. I think that's great. I love that. You know, as soon as you touch the button, doesn't matter what it is, it tells you. Cruise control comes up, adaptive cruise control, on or off. There you go. And then dist distance um, driving assistance mode. All of these things, brilliant. That's fabulous. The driving position is excellent. It's a really straight ahead driving position. Column stocks are nice and easy. They're exactly where you expect to find them and they work how you expect them to work. There's two paddles behind the steering wheel to adjust brake regen. We'll talk when we drive. And then on the door, you've got your usual suspects and mirror controls and windows. To open the door, you push the button. So again, that's what I was talking about on the outside. Little tactile things. Again, the same as that opaque roof. Just a tiny little soft click of a button, and it changes the roof. As I say, the feeling of the materials inside, even the dash material, which is a kind of weird kind of rubberized leather that you get on the top of the door man-made kind of leather which you know and the side tunnel here is really nice and this kind of veneer that's down this black veneer which is lovely i really like it i just wish that some of those beeps and bongs and all that safety stuff just wasn't quite like it was i just find it just a bit infuriating when you've got to do stuff like that that's the only thing but in terms of the actual interior, its layout, its usability, but more importantly, how up market it feels when you sit in here, I think it's another winner from Lexus. Now, if you're expecting a fly in this Lexus branded ointment, then it is here that we find it. And it is one of the most disappointing things with this car. In fact, it is the most disappointing thing with this car. It uses the same 71.4 kilowatt hour battery that you find in the BZ4X and the Subaru Solterra. Which means, according to Lexus and the WLTP figures, this Takumi car on the 20 inch alloy wheels should give a range of 252 miles. It's 272 miles on the 18 inch wheels. However, the reality is very, very different, I'm afraid. According to the EV database, the real world range of this is 195 miles. And having driven from Surrey to Scotland, sorry, just very, very no noisy motorbike going past, having driven from Surrey to Scotland, I struggle to even get that out of this car. As I say, I charged this car over 350 miles, starting, okay, it didn't start with an absolute full battery, but I charged this car four times yesterday coming up. The other disappointing thing, apart from this really flimsy charging flap on the Lexus, is its charging speed. Now, its charging speed is 150 kilowatts. Now, you might say, well, that's fine, Brian. Mm, its charging curve, however, tells a very different story. It will drop once you get, it only holds that maximum charging speed to around sort of 35, 40%. Once you get past that, once you get close to 80%, it's struggling to pull 50 kilowatts, I found. Now, Lexus say you'll go from the 10 to 80% benchmark in the usual 30 minutes. 
I can't comment on that because I wasn't letting it drop that far yesterday before I stopped and charged again. I wasn't chancing it because, as I say, with the aircon on, all of a sudden it was wiping 40 miles off the predicted range of the car. I haven't got this car, even despite the fact I charged up to over um, to full last night. Um, when I when I put the aircon on this morning, it dropped below 200 miles as its predicted range. That's poor. That's really, really, very, very poor. For a bespoke EV platform, and as I say, especially one that comes from the world of Toyota and Lexus, who have for decades been given as hybrids and electrified vehicles, I am shocked that they haven't got the better. Now, Toyota say they're working on a solution to this, and the car will get updates, I'm sure. But for me, that is a real um, disappointing fact, and it's a really important one as well, because if you look at the likes of one of Genesis' new key rivals, uh, Genesis, with the GV70 electrified, which is a rival for this car. That's not even a bespoke EV. It's much better in range, it's much more efficient, and it delivers much harder, uh, faster, and better charging speeds, and its charging curve is a lot better. So this is a real disappointment for me, and I would have thought Lexus would have done better at this. Now, if you are charging at home from your seven kilowatt wall box, then you're looking at going from flat, sorry, you're looking at going from flat to full in around about 10 and a half hours. The car does have an onboard 11 kilowatt charger, which means if you do have that faster wall box, then you can drop that down to that time down to six and a half. But for me, this is a real killer point for me with this car. All right, well, good morning uh, from uh, a, a grey overcast Lockerbie. It was, uh, it was quite heavy rain here last night. Anyway, um, it's not cold. Um, it's currently, let's have a look now, just after 20 past 7 in the morning, 17 degrees. So it's nice ambient temperature outside. I had the car in charge overnight last night, the new Lexus RZ450E. And uh, <laughs> it's charged up to 100%. Look at the range that it's saying that I've got now. 150 miles, which is significantly less than the 252 miles that Lexus say that it's designed to do. Yeah, this is part of the big disappointment with this car. Toyota, let, Lexus, let me just be very, very clear about this right now. You need to up your game when it comes to the EV market. It's not going to go away, the EVs. I get what you're saying, that they're not going to be the be-all and end-all and there's going to be other combustion um, you know, power plants available and whatever, but... EVs are a massive part of the market now, um, and your competition is thick and fast, and it's good. And £75,000 for a car that's saying is only going to go 150 miles on a full charge. That's not good. Oh, right. Performance and handling. Let's have a look here. What this is all about. Now, as I said earlier, this is my big bugbear. Hang on a second. Parking support brake off. Hold this button to say you've read that message. Done that. Uh, caution message there. Tick your privacy notice there. Agree. Press brake pedal and push power switch to start. Done that. Ready. Right, we can go now. What a faff. Uh, right. Well, let's get off this bit here before I start talking about the car. A little bit. Um, okay, now, what's really important to understand with the Lexus is, as I said, they've not just taken a BZ4X or a Solterra and gone, we'll put a Lexus body on it. This is different. This is a very different car. You only get it with the dual motor setup. So it only comes with uh, all wheel drive. For the moment, certainly. What you also get, you see, there's that beeping noise because it's, why is it beeping at me? Anyway, um, but the four-wheel drive setup is actually quite clever because what it does is it uses sensors in the ECU to distribute torque depending on what's needed. So, for instance, you know, we're on a kind of twisting kind of sort of like valley road here going through the Scottish borders. Um, if it was wet, for instance, and uh, we're going into a corner coming out of the corner, the car knows uh, the road conditions and it knows what I'm doing. So I'm exiting a bend and I'm applying a certain amount of throttle. Oh, sheep, 
let's just avoid those. Thank you very much. Uh, so it knows what I'm doing. So it can apportion up to 80% to the rear axle to give better traction coming out of a bend. So in other words, not to the front where it would understeer on. Um, if you're on, say, a flat open road, like on the, the M6 motorway, like I was yesterday, coming up here, it knows that. So what it does is it then apportions up to 70% to the front axle for better efficiency and for better straight line stability. So it's very clever what it does. Um, and it, it is, I, 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 it really feels quite sure-fitted. I mean, as I say, okay, it's not a sports car. And if you try and make it behave like one, it's where it will fall apart a little bit. But at least you have the confidence in knowing that if you are in a bit of a, you know, sort of like a, a, not a sticky situation, but you know, you're a bit of a back road and it's wet or whatever, the car will look after you. There's a huge amount of safety systems on the car, as I've said, you know, the cameras for the parking, uh, the, the, the cross traffic alert, the lane keep assist as you would normally expect, all of that kind of stuff. Um, it's very good, the driver monitor thing, yeah, it's a bit, it bugs me a bit, but you know what, we're going down that route, everyone wants those more kind of safety things, so I get it, I'm in the minority probably with that. What I don't feel like I'm in the minority with, however, is how much it all interferes with you as a driver. Now, this is my big bugbear, and forgive me, because I'm going to bring a soapbox out now. All of this stuff, which always defaults on, I think takes responsibility away from you as a driver. And therefore, driving becomes very, very easy to a lot of people. And let's be honest, there's probably people out there that shouldn't be driving. And I just think, you know, the more and more that the car does for you, the less and less you become aware of your surroundings and your situations as a driver. That's why I'm dead against things like autonomy, you know, because where do we get to with this situation, especially in the likes of the US? where you know, you're caught speeding, or worse still, you cause an accident by wandering into another lane, and your defense says, well, the car never told me, officer, your honor, whatever. You know, where does the law stand as we go forward? Anyway, soapbox away, let's get back to the Lexus. Right, so it's 309 brake horsepower that the Lexus produces from twin motors, which means it'll dispatch not to 60 in 5.3 seconds. So it's substantially quicker than the Toyota. Uh, and the Subaru on which it shares the platform. So again, Lexus are going to great lengths to differentiate their car from the others, which I have to applaud. And it does feel different to drive. As I say, it's not a sports car. And if you do push it, you will find it will fall apart a little bit because it's quite a heavy car. And although the weight is based all low down, it just doesn't feel comfortable doing it. Do you know what I mean? It's just one of those kind of cars. It's, it's like, I don't know, asking a teenager to get up early in the morning. They will do it, but reluctantly, and they'll let you know that they don't really want to. It's a bit like that, if I'm honest. That's kind of how it feels. Where it really excels is if you just dial it back to sort of like six, seven tenths, sit back, relax a little bit more. That's where the Lexus comes into its own. The refinement is superb. Now, I bleat on a lot about refinement in cars, especially with EVs, but it is important, especially if you do long journeys like I did yesterday. You don't want coarse road surfaces make your eardrums bleed with tyre slap, and you don't want wind noise coming from big door mirrors and stuff like that, and you don't get that from the Lexus. I would say it's probably not as refined, believe it or not, as the UX300e was, but I'm going to attribute maybe that down to the 20-inch wheels of this car because that's the only bit I can really pick up on is there's a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of tyre noise on a really harsh surface. That's it. Otherwise, this is a serene place to be. The other thing about it is the comfort. And again, I'm really, I'm really um, grateful that Lexus have gone down that. I don't think, although they do sports cars with the LC500 and they have had sporting cars with the RCF and the ISF, I don't think they do them as well as, dare I suggest, people at BMW and you know, Mercedes AMG stuff. So I think where they should f feature is much more that kind of luxury and refinement thing. And that's where they excel at because this car is so comfortable to drive. It is blissful. You know, Okay, yeah, I stopped and charged four times on the motorway yesterday. Irrespective of that, 
when I was driving the car, it was just a breeze. It was an absolute breeze. You set your distance guidance cruise control on the M6, um, and you just oh, and turn off the safety system, turn off that ro silly road speed assistance, otherwise it's beeping at you for going over 70 miles an hour all the time. Um, and the car just sits back, and, oh, so you just sit back, and the car just wafts you along. It's lovely when you do that. It's a really nice car to drive in that scenario. Out here on a little twisty kind of country road, maybe not so much if you up the speed, but if you just dial it back a little bit, as I say, and just not take your time, but don't ask too much of it, and it's absolutely fine. Now, I want to talk about the steering a little bit, because this is where you do notice it a little bit. Oh, cattle grid. It's a bit vague, if I'm honest. It's a little bit vague. Now, Lexus, like Toyota, are going to offer um, the RZ with OMG. I kid you not, that's what it's called, one motion grip. So in other words, it's a yoke, it's like a kind of aircraft style yoke instead of a steering wheel. Where, and it will be the first car to have a non-mechanical link between steering wheel and steering axle. In other words, it's all done by electronics. Now, the reason, the Toyota and Lexus say that um, one of the benefits of this, it means it will give a lot of communication but dial back on interference. So in other words, when this wheels hit potholes and the wheel jiggles in your hand, it'll take, remove that. But forgive me for saying this, Lexus, isn't that what steering feel is? So how can you give good communication by taking some of that communication away? I don't understand that. I don't get it. As it stands in the standard setup with this, you know, with obviously a steering wheel, it's vague a little bit. Yeah, it just, you're not 100% sure what's happening underneath. And that's what I mean. It's not a sports utility vehicle. It's not an iX3. It's not a Jaguar I Pace. Not even close to being a Jaguar I Pace. But you know, you put it up against, say, the Mercedes Benz EQC or maybe the Audi Q8 e-tron cars, which feature a little bit more on the kind of, you know, the refinement and the kind of luxury and the cosseting side. And that's where the Lexus really wins. That's where it's it's raison d'etre or raison d'etre is. That's where I think Lexus really need to concentrate on. Don't do sporty stuff, Lexus. Just keep it like this, and it's fine. Uh, brakes. Brakes are okay. Brakes have got a relatively nice feel to them, actually. Um, they've got, you need a decent shove, but I don't mind that so much because, again, it's sort of you doing it. It's you that's making the effort. It's not the car doing it for you. So I do quite like that. You can adjust the regen uh, via two paddles on the steering wheel, which I find really, really odd because to add it on, you pull on the minus paddle, and to take it off, you pull on the plus paddle don't understand that theory but there we go and um, what I will say however is it's not one pedal driving you don't get that but again I, that's not a thing I really particularly look for in an EV I want some degree of brake regen because it's nice again out here where you don't you just have to lift your foot a little bit and the car slows enough just for the corner that's when I like it uh, and I like the fact you can dial it up and dial it down um, via the paddles you don't have to go into the screen to do that uh, I've always preferred it via paddles like Hyundai and Kia do. So, you know, kudos, Lexus. That's that's the right thing to do. There are different driving modes with the with the Lexus as well, but they are buried in the screen. You've got to go into the screen. Um, if I go into, I think it's in the car, but here, yeah, here we go. So we've got normal. We press sport. Dials glow red, and there's a much sharper throttle response. It then feels like you've got well in excess of that 300 horsepower as you just blip the throttle as you come out of a bend it really hunkers down and pushes you forward now that's where you can feel or you can feel you can sort of see the, the the idea behind that torque distribution and it's all done via electronics and the reason for that is is because it can change it in milliseconds it's much faster doing it that way than you would get in say a mechanical setup so it's reaction time is much much faster um, and as I say, it makes the car feel very sure-footed, if not a sort of enjoyable steer, if that makes sense. Uh, the other ones you've got, so that's normal in sport. And just let these bikes go past. This is a very popular 
uh, bikers route this going from Hoyek to Moffat um, the other ones you've got is eco range and custom uh, so obviously eco and range you can obviously set uh, sorry that dials everything back so you maximize your range which you will need if you put your air con on um, and then custom where you can again set things up exactly how you kind of like it so there's a bit more where you can tailor a little bit more of the Lexus than you can in maybe some of the other cars um, which is quite nice that's good enjoy gentlemen be safe um, yeah so that you can do you can change it as I say depending obviously on your mood and how you see fit as I say ride quality is excellent um, even on these 20 inch wheels the, the the damper settings I think are judged just about right I would say there's a tiny bit of float just as you go over some of the sharper kind of crests it just kind of go like that it's just slightly not quite as controlled um, you know as some other cars but it's certainly no it doesn't throw you around it doesn't feel crashy or anything like a Tesla Model Y uh, does from the class below it's well judged damping um, but as I say it's only on those really sharper crests where you just do feel they kind of maybe reach the top of the travel a little bit too quickly um, and that's it and then obviously the same again on a compression it just kind of, kind of bottoms out a little bit but that's only if you're being you know, did I suggest a bit more exuberant with your drive than you would be. But no, the ride quality on the whole is very, very good. So you're kind of getting the impression, hopefully, from me that the Lexus has differentiated enough away from the BZ4X and the Solterra to justify the cost that they ask for the car. It feels like it has moved up in the classes to compete with BMW, to compete with Audi, to compete with Jaguar and Mercedes-Benz at that level, which makes it even more infuriating that the one flaw, or the major flaw that those other two cars had, the Subaru and the Toyota, is the one thing that Lexus haven't done anything about, and that is this refinement, uh, sorry, this um, efficiency and range situation. It's just, so disappointing and I know we've talked about it in the usability section but I'm going to go on about it here I'm averaging you know 2.7 miles per kilowatt hour now equate that on a 71 kilowatt uh, sorry yeah 2.1 miles 2.7 miles, miles per kilowatt hour equate that on a 71 kilowatt hour battery which isn't its usable capacity its usable, usable capacity is 64 kilowatt hours so you're a sub 200 mile range a sub 200 mile range in a premium badged electric SUV that's going up against Genesis, BMW, Mercedes and Audi and Jaguar it's the one thing that they should have concentrated on to change and it's the one thing they haven't and that for me is the biggest biggest disappointment with this car and is a real consideration when it comes to whether or not you want to buy it. Now, as I said, it is a very different car. It's not just a reskinned BZ4X. As we've seen, there's a lot more Lexus in this car, and therefore, there is a premium price to pay over the Toyota. And of course, it's competing in a slightly different market sector. It is a bigger car. And um, pricing will start at £64,500 for the premium pack car. Then you move to the premium plus pack car at £68,500 or you can go up to the Takumi which this model is at £74,500. If you want it with the uh, bi-tone paint finish like this one has then I think it takes up to just over £75,000. So it's not a cheap car um, and as I say I, I will keep coming back to that range and efficiency thing because that really does irk me on a car at this price. Uh, that, that's what you're getting. There are so many other cars out there that, that do it better than that. Running costs, okay, um, you get a standard three year warranty with Lexus, however, what you do get with them, which I think is very good in fairness to them, so same with Toyota, if you continue to service it at a Lexus dealer, then every service, every yearly service you get, they'll put an extra, an extra year's warranty on it free of charge up to 10 years or 100,000 miles, which I think is superb. Also as well, they're making a big beef about the fact that they think their batteries will last longer over that 10 year period. So although there's just the usual kind of standard 
eight year warranty on the batteries. Lexus are saying that percentage of battery um, degradation is much less at the 10 years, 100,000 miles in this car than it is in some of its key rivals. So there is some other things to consider when you are looking at the Lexus. Now competition for the Lexus um, is out there and it's from those premium badges that I've talked about all the way through this uh, road test review. So BMW, for instance, you've got the iX3, which is probably the main rival for this particular car from BMW. Although at the price point of this Takumi, you are just getting into the, the slightly larger iX and it's eDrive 40 uh, guys, as long as you don't go too mad on the spec. So you, the, the BMW maybe give you the choice of those two cars. Uh, Mercedes-Benz, EQC 400. Now we're going to be road testing the EQC 400 again um, in a few weeks, not because they've done anything different to it, it's just that it's been a few years since we've driven it and I wanted to do a more up-to-date road test on it. So it'll be interesting me getting back into the Mercedes to see how it feels um, against the Lexus. Um, Audi, um, we road tested the Q8 e-tron the other week. Now, although that was the 55 model in Sportback, guys, and it was £100,000, the range starts a lot less than that if you go for a 50 model. And size-wise, it's about similar. Um, so you could suggest that the Q8 e-tron and its 50 guys is a rival for the Lexus. Jaguar's I-Pace, we, we can't not mention it because it's been out for ages and we still love it. And again, price point-wise, size-wise, range, all the rest of it, it's bang on the money. And of course, again, it's one of those premium badges. Now, we're also going to be seeing new cars coming into the market over the next 12, 24 months. And they're going to be things like the Polestar 3. Now, we're really looking forward to that. And of course, Polestar are making real big inroads into this. And perhaps, and I don't know, there might be a Volvo equivalent along soon. We've already seen them launch uh, the large EX90 at close to £100,000. And of course, they've now just shown the small EX30. There's the other little midsize XC40, which we love. Is there going to be sort of like an XC60 to, you know, compete uh, an electrified version of the XC60? I wouldn't be shocked if there wasn't, certainly with the Polestar platform um, being able to be used by Volvo as well. So that, we could see something from Volvo as well. But also remember, Maserati, they're getting in on the act as well. They're really, really hammering home the fact that the brand is going somewhere um, and they're getting out of the doldrums. And we've seen that with the, the, their piston engine cars, which are getting great reviews at the moment. So the new Grecali is going to come along in its full gory version. It's electrified badge as well. And of course, there's Porsche as well with the Macan. We're going to be seeing that as an all-electric model as well. So there's certainly a choice out there if you want a premium badge for your sort of like 65 to 80,000 pound all-electric SUV. So here's what we like and what we don't like about the new Lexus RZ450e. We like, it's styling. The interior design, the materials used and the build quality. It's refined. It's well equipped to standard. And of course, there's the legendary Lexus after sales care. We don't like. Well, there's too many warning chimes and safety overkill in the interior that you have to wade through. The steering is a little bit vague. The lack of future EV tech, such as vehicle to load or 800 volt architecture, especially from a bespoke EV platform. And of course, the main one for us is the poor efficiency, range, and charging curve. Let me be very, very clear about one thing before I deliver this verdict. I like this car. I like this car a lot. There's a lot to like about it. I love the way it looks. I think it's a great looking car. And I've always had a bit of a soft spot for Lexus. My late father was a massive fan of them. He had two LS400s in his, his driving career. And I quietly admired them from the driving seat of my Jaguar XJ6 that I had at the time. And as I say, they just, they do things a little bit differently. And I, and I do like the brand. And I say, this particular car, there is a lot to love about it. As I say, the styling, the way the interior is, the, the, the materials that they've used, it's quiet, it's refined, it's so smooth, you expect it to come with Hugh Grant in the boot free of charge. Which makes it even more infuriating that there is just so many flaws with this car as far as I can see, especially at this price point when so many people are getting it right with non-bespoke EVs. I mean, look at the BMW iX3. That's not a bespoke EV. The Genesis GV70 electrified, not a bespoke EV. 
And yet both of those cars deliver a better range and better efficiency than this one from Lexus, who, as I say, let me remind you, have been beating the electrified drum for decades now with hybrids, which makes it even more frustrating that, 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 that this is lacking in that area. There's no 800 volt architecture. There's no vehicle to load with it. The charging curve is woeful. The charging speed's 150 kilowatts and only then for about 30, 40% of the charge. And even then, it's delivering a sub 200 mile range. If you were expecting this to be another Lexus invasion like it was back in 1989 with LS400, I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed. Thank you for watching yet another episode of Auto EV and thank you for joining me back in Scotland again. As always, you know we want to properly road test cars, so there's no point in just driving them around for half a day and then giving you a video on it. We test them properly on a good proper road trip, so hopefully you've enjoyed it. Now if you have enjoyed it, make sure you press the little um, like button down below because that helps us. And don't forget, make sure you're subscribed to the channel. If you're new to us and you wonder what it's about, click on the subscribe button because you'll also be notified if you press the wee bell there when our next video is uploaded and then goes live. As I say, if you've enjoyed it, make sure you like the video and also give us your comments as well. We want to hear from you. What do you think about the cars we review? What's your thoughts on this new electric Lexus? Am I right to be really disappointed with it? Did you expect more from Lexus? Or do you think that actually that's probably just enough for me? Let me know in the comment section down below. Now remember as well, we're across all social media platforms and that's important as well because we do like you to follow us there. So if you're a big fan of the old Instagram and the Facebook and the Twitter and the, the LinkedIn and all that kind of stuff, even that talk tick thing now that the kids love so much we're on there as well so go and give us a follow there too and if you're desperate as i say to even see even more reviews from us then stay on the youtube channel now because there's well over 140 videos now and it's not just road test reviews it's twin tests it's used car reviews there's van reviews there as well motorbike reviews and of course our electric icon series all that remains for me to say is thank you once again for watching. Thank you for putting up with me. Thank you for putting up with this wonderful Scottish scenery that's behind me. Thanks for supporting the channel. And I'll see you again soon. Probably back down in England. Oh, sheep thing everywhere down here. God almighty. <laughs>